welcome everybody. I hope you guys had a fantastic morning, a good lunch, and are all fueled up for this afternoon's sessions. I'm Beth Schultz, Enterprise Connect Program Co-Chair and Editor of No Jitter, and it's my privilege to uh, co-moderate this year's Mobility Summit with our Mobility Track Chair, Michael Finneran, who is also President of DBN, DBRN Associates and esteemed uh, panel of industry experts. Now before I bring those folks on stage, I have just a couple of quick notes for our, our, our audience. Um, the first is that, you know, if you participated in the UC Summit this morning, you know that we're taking audience questions via Twitter this year. And so if you could twit, uh, tweet those questions using the hashtag EC16 or mention at EnterpriseCon, and we will um, get some of those answered at the end of uh, our session here today. So enterprise mobility. The big question that we're exploring today is, does uh, IT need a rethink on, on enterprise mobility? And that kind of um, stems from the situation we have in organizations, pretty pervasively in organizations, where the marketing and the digital channels are really focused on the B2B, the consumer facing applica mobile applications while um, enterprise IT um, focuses on the B2E or business to employee applications. And you know, so the, the one side of the company uh, is dealing with all those kind of cool and innovative things to encourage customer engagement while IT has to um, do everything to en enable employees to communicate, uh, whether uh, that's via email or text messaging or conferencing, you know, as seamlessly and conveniently and securely as whether they're sitting in the conference room or you know on the side of the road in their car, um, and that and that is obviously a big challenge. And and um, we have been hearing so much about the mobile first enterprise and you know, all sorts of new technologies coming up, bubbling up to uh, deal with the mobile first enterprise. Yet there's still a very pervasive feeling that IT is simply not doing enough um, to uh, take advantage of enterprise mobility and really use it to help fuel transformational change, um, improve the way that workers work. So the big question, does IT need a reboot on enterprise mobility? And let's bring out our panelists and have them ask the, uh, address that question. I am going to introduce these folks um, in alph alphabetical order um, by the company name. So first, we have Lee Wagner, who is uh, AVP of Mobility Solutions Services with AT&T. Hi, Lee. Second chair there. Next, we have Josh Hazlett, who is the general manager of Mitel Next. Thank you, Beth. Joseph Martin, who is the Director of National Solutions Engineering with Sprint. Thank you. Yep. And Brian Katz, Director of the EUC Mobile Strategy with VMware. And of course, for many of you, a familiar face, Michael Finnerin, my co-moderator. Thanks, Beth. So, gentlemen, um, as I said, you know, we see this organizational, organizational split, B2C, B2E, um, B2C that's on fire, B2E, B2 uh, really not so much. So, um, how do we get from um, taking what we see happening in the B2C channels and putting it to use in B2E. Um, do you agree that there's sort of this disconnect between what's going on and how do we get that, uh, diminish that and, and push forward? Yeah, well, I, I think it, uh, and we see this with a, with a bunch of our clients, is do you take the principles that exist in B2C and apply them to B2E? And I think the main one is do you make the content relevant to the person that's using the content, and I think there's kind of two two real dichotomies of that. The the first is it generational. Um, are you presenting things in text and other forms for millennials, as an example? And then the sex, second is 
do you just provide all the apps in a big lot or do you create the apps that are relevant to group or person and present that to them in a way that's relevant to that group or person as opposed to uh, just every app? Because there is an app overload everywhere and the more, ma more you make it personal, the more likely they are to use it. I, I think the key thing that we see at Mitel is, uh, as you see vendors, we've traditionally focused on knowledge workers. And so when you think about the way that we create apps and we extend UC communications, we focus on people that get productivity from the traditional PC environment and desk phones. And as we start to see the transition, uh, the pervasiveness of mobile devices and smartphones in the hands of other communities of workers inside the uh, company, the transition of B2E becomes much more important. The productivity uh, gains that we were able to leverage with knowledge workers, with leveraging the PC and the desk phone, um, have really been realized. And at this point, when we talk about, you know, is UC a reality, we need to start looking at the areas where productivity games have not been realized. And so one of the things Mitel's done is focused on identifying SaaS prevent, uh, providers uh, that can extend workflow, uh, workflow products uh, to service worker communities and information worker communities versus knowledge workers, and then embed communications in those to improve those workflow enhancements. So I think as, as far as IT's uh, consideration of where they should look for productivity and how they should address B2E, it's really looking at the mobile only and mobile first workers, instead of trying to take the desktop, desktop experience and extend it to a mobile device. That's interesting, I wanna come back to that idea. Let's go to you, Joseph, first. Sure, um, so at Sprint, uh, we feel very strongly that uh, it's still a, about enabling the enterprise worker as a carrier. And so, um, much like we introduced Workplace as a Service and one here at Enterprise Connect last year, um, uh, in late 2015, we introduced a new offering, Mobility as a Service. And uh, what that essentially does is it gives the enterprise an alternative to just surrendering to BYOD. And so for the corporate liable user, we set up a pretty easy to understand method where we have a matrix of devices and uh, a couple of terms that they can pick with a plan type where they pick how much data they want. And then as part of that, with as few as 15 subscribers or as big as you want, uh, what the customer enjoys is we'll load their applications and then the experience perpetuates where the devices are refreshed, uh, they get a white glove care, et cetera. So we think in enterprise, uh, it's about enabling uh, first and then uh, I'll talk more about what we wanna do uh, as we help enterprises deal with uh, cacophony of, of, of devices and, and what all their users now want to do. So th that's what we're doing first. Okay. Brian? So VMware, we like to look at it as it's about enabling the customer and your employees are your customers too. And I think that that's part of where a lot of companies forget that your employees are your first customers and they're interfacing with your regular customers all the time and how do you enable them to get their work done? Because it's the same thing, whether you're giving something to a consumer or you're giving it to your employee, the question is, how do I make it easy for them? How do I keep them in the app? How do I allow them to get their workflow or their tasks done? And so, you know, we're developing solutions and we're actually partnering with, I think, everybody on the stage here, but many of the um, vendors who are here and exhibitors. But the goal here is, how do we make it simple to deploy, regardless of whether it's BYOD or a COPE device, how do we make it easy for users to sign in, share data between apps, and yet secure them and make it easy to use? Those are certainly common themes that have kind of perpetuated year after year, so I'm just kind of curious what's new now. So what's new now is for us, um, we've released VMware Identity Manager, and you know, I don't want to make this a pitch, but in reality, identity has become big in the application game. And people don't want to have to remember all their passwords. They don't want to have to figure out, you know, how do I sign into this one? Do I have to now sign into this other app to get this workflow done? And what you're starting to see is that the nature of apps is changing from single task, single focus to a workflow task. So you may actually open your email, have something from Salesforce that you have to address, and it's one single workflow and you may never leave your inbox, you know, whatever you're using for that. 
The same thing can happen in another app, but you know, I think Josh mentioned before, mobile first and mobile only. They're not the same thing. The goal is to enable your users, regardless of the device that they're using, to get that workflow done and move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the, uh, when we start talking about uh, uh, development in the, the B2E space, there are a lot of different ways of doing this. Uh, uh, first, it isn't, it, it's been around for quite a while, from uh, checking in rental cars to getting your tickets scanned to get into the ballpark. It's just we seem to be expanding the scope today. Now, most organizations start with email, which is out-of-the-box application. Uh, to move beyond that, uh, we have a lot of different choices. Uh, the ISVs, the Oracles, SAPs, McKesson, Salesforce, all have downloadable apps. Download the app, put in your credentials, you're mobile. Um, or uh, we have package solutions, and uh, I know a few of the uh, our, our participants here are uh, uh, offer those, uh, all the way on to custom developments, uh, which is generally the more most challenging of these. Uh, I'd like to start with first Lee, Lee and Joe. Could you uh, uh, one uh, uh, give us a quick rundown of uh, uh, what your organizations offer in each of those areas, uh, and uh, what sort of general guidance do you give customers? Do, do, do you roll your own or uh, uh, take something that's already uh, packaged and can? Uh, Lee? Yeah, uh, well, I think there's no, depending on where you are in the market, there's not a, a single answer to that question. And we provide all three. We have a, plenty of packaged apps that are feel either, uh, you know, specific to the, the task. Um, and then we have a set of custom developed apps and programs that we do around that. And I think it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. If you're a smaller company and you're, you're trying to target and fix one thing, a packaged app probably serves that purpose very well. But if you're talking about what we were talking about here just a second, in integrating workflow, you need some sort of custom way to do that because it <coughs> needs to happen on a frequent occurrence and there are new tasks that have come out there. So to have a, a, a platform that allows you to do that, and I don't mean necessarily sell a platform, but you, if you have an integration layer to be able to do that, you can be quick and agile about making that happen. It may require a couple of tools. So we give advice. We provide all three of those, but we, we definitely, as you're a larger organization, you need to have that. We were working with an airline uh, this, this fall. They had over 50 apps, lots of embedded infrastructure associated with that. And um, we, you know, we created a hub concept associated with that, so it was personalized, and then they could use the apps that they needed to apply to the users, and it, it became real fast and odd, agile for them to be able to do that. So it takes all, it depends on where you are, and it takes all three to be able to serve it. Uh, Joe, I know uh, uh, Sprint has quite a lineup in t terms of uh, fleet management, workforce management. Uh, uh, well, what else you got? Sure, so if we start at uh, the simplest level, you know, we are a uh, purveyor of both uh, Microsoft and Google's productivity suites. So as an example with Google, very often times we'll use forms and, and the customer's just gonna kind of do their own simplistic thing and then tie it with sheets and, and they get some, uh, some business process improvement. Um, Canvas, more of a, an off the shelf set of um, pre-configured applications that can be configured to that customer, not necessarily customized, that's probably too strong of a word. Uh, then we also have, um, uh, app sheets, which is fairly interesting because it's the form concept, but they're all pushed down to an app uh, on the user's device in such a way that as that app grows in complexity across different parts of the organization, there's an opportunity for more linkage. And then we also uh, have uh, offerings that are uh, entirely customized that involve uh, consultation and then we put that on our paper and then maintain that for the customer. Wow. Now what Josh, Mitel's kind of new getting into this. Uh, uh, one of the parts of the, the, the recent Mitel uh, uh, mobility initiative that surprised me the most was your uh, 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 correspondence with uh, uh, Fieldware for field service. I is that a, a one-shot deal? Is this the, the first of many? Uh, this, this is a new tack for Mitel. I would say it's the, the first of a focus group uh, of apps that we see 
uh, are true workflow enablement tools that will be taken into specific verticals where we identify that there is the largest percentage of disenfranchised workers inside the environment that are separated from the traditional UC solutions that our customers tend to adopt into their organizations. So uh, Mitel wants to meaningfully bring solutions to market where we can embed communications into vertical workflow apps and then connect those back into the enterprise. Um, you know, traditionally, skills-based routing has, has been uh, limited to a contact center type environment. But if you think about a field worker who's out on a customer location working on a product that they might need assistance with, you can apply skills-based routing to finding him an expert uh, or her an expert to where they could very easily in the app uh, click to communicate. Based upon presence, you could identify available resources. Skills-based routing, you could find the right uh, you know, engineer to assist at that point in time. And then, of course, connect with voice, messaging, and video all real time. So we see that there's a tremendous opportunity to, to look at vertical applications. Um, horizontal apps, you know, like Salesforce.com and a bunch of these others, uh, widely adopted by knowledge workers, but we think vertical apps actually improve a lot of that workflow. It's interesting, there's an application that AT&T actually represents called ProntoForms. Um, ProntoForms creates almost a middleware layer that connects the back-end office uh, ERP-type systems and glues those together with forms that the field workers would have out in the field to complete uh, you know, important pieces of data and then have that populate across multiple databases uh, back into the back office. So it's a really good way to create this middleware layer that connects those field workers back into the knowledge worker environment. Uh, Brian, I, uh, I was going to ask you about uh, identity management. Before we get to that, you're, you're fairly recent to uh, VMware AirWatch. Uh, you, you had spent a good deal of your career on the, on the buying side of the equation here as a, uh, as a user of these things. So uh, uh, what's your view on this as, uh, in terms of uh, which so, tools are best yeah, and how? Thank you. Yeah, I, did, I just joined VMware a little less than a year ago. I came from the enterprise, and you know, it's heartening to hear what's happening and being that I was on the IT side and on the innovation side, looking at what we're seeing with MBAS, mobile backend as a service companies, uh, RMADS, uh, remote, rapid mobile application development, where they're actually taking many of these databases and these um, repositories of data and allowing you to mix and match to build those workflows. Because one thing to remember is not everybody's using a phone. It's you use the tool that makes sense where you are. So although we talk about mobile only, it's maybe the phone here, it may be a tablet somewhere else, it may be a Windows 10 desktop. And it's how you provide that digital workspace and bring all these apps together, get them to work together with identity. Mm -hmm. And you know, it doesn't matter whether it's a SaaS app or it's an internal app. And it's how do you get that, those things to the user and actually remove the difficulty out of them. So I'm not going to name anybody, but you know, for example, we had a ticketing system when I was in the enterprise that had over 60 fields that you were supposed to fill out. <laughs> Nobody filled out more than eight or 10. What do you do with mobile? You look at the 10 that everybody fills out, and that's, what, you know, that's the piece you do. I know um, you mentioned uh, Pronto Forms, and there are a couple others that do that. And it's a matter of figuring out what your users are doing, what their workflow is, and how do you help them meet it without making it more difficult? Mm -hmm. Now, the, 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 to, to your, uh, your, your current life at uh, VMware AirWatch, uh, 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 security and, of course, identity management is part of that, which uh, has improved greatly since we've got Touch ID and iVerify and facial recognition. Uh, but the, all the solutions these other guys are talking about here, uh, do they uh, interoperate immediately or does it require a modification to get them into one of your, uh, uh, your, your uh, uh, secure sandboxes? So, yes and yes. Okay. <laughs> um, depending upon what the solution is, it may require uh, um, some changes to it. But with our new identity solution, we integrate with whoever your identity provider is, whether it's Ping, Okta, if you don't have one, if it's Microsoft AD, Azure Active Directory Services, and you can use it with SaaS. So you can bring Salesforce into this container. You can use that, make sure that you have single sign-on, make sure that you can only access it on a device that's managed. And that becomes important because you want to secure your data. So you don't necessarily want somebody taking their regular phone, you know, they're out and they're using Salesforce on it, and it may be jailbroken, maybe something else. You don't want them necessarily using a laptop where you don't know what's on it. You know, their kid may surf the web. You may have malware or something else on that. So you can actually put these in the secure containers. Mm -hmm. It's very simple. 
and you create that platform or you know we're calling it a digital workspace mm -hmm. it's a digital workspace to make it consumer simple but enterprise secure for everybody the um uh, other, well, one of the other big things that we're seeing in the, uh, the mobility space we'll be talking about here at the show uh, is the Internet of Things. Um, now, uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out where this is going to fit. Uh, we have the, the digital channels group, so the marketing group taking care of the B2C. Uh, we generally have the IT group who's taking care of the B2E. Is IoT going to be one of those two? Uh, is it going to be a completely different line of business organization that picks this up? Uh, and, and Lee, since you're in the, uh, the, the, the consulting end of this, let's, let's start with you again. Well, I mean, at at and this for us, it's, it's the biggest thing that we're doing right now. We've got over uh, 30 billion connected or 30 million connected devices out there, um, and we're connecting them to all sorts of things that you couldn't imagine at this particular point point in time, including cars and other things. For us, and I think for the future, if you kind of look at the users, it, users started out as basically transactors or users of data, and they've kind of started to move to collaborators. There's lots of UC and other things. We think the future is really you're an asset enabler, right? And so whether they, that be a, a customer or more likely an employee, and um, to get that information from an asset, whatever that asset is, to an employee so they can make a decision or even have made the decision already is hugely, we've got dashboards, we've got workflow, you can message it in, you can put it into the ticking system, there's all sorts of things that you can do with it. And if you have the proper uh, setup from the Internet of Things to your mobile app, I mean, let's face it, the people that are dealing with the assets, they're mostly mobile, right? They're mostly mobile, mm -hmm. and that's who you need to do. So I think it's integrated. And I think it's a huge opportunity to really change the environment for the. How for do you the, get over the sort of um, we want this? We, you know, um, in, as a matter of fact, I think Roland Trollope kind of mentioned this in the UC Summit this morning. Is we can push all this stuff to uh, we can from the cloud. We can push all all of these enterprise cool enterprise apps, but we're going to push updates, um, you know, automatically. Um, same thing with IoT. But the enterprise IT exec says, no, I want control over that. Um, I, I want to know when we're going to, I want to dictate when we update it. It's not going to be like that consumer model. Um, how do you get over that in the enterprise? Well, that seems to be a, a pretty big hurdle. Well, for us, I think there's, there's platforms that do that for you. And I think it, you know, using the IoT as the um, example here, what you have at the edge and what you control on the platform is a really big decision. And there's ways that you can do it at the edge and at the platform and making that decision right based on the amount of data and the security is, is a complex decision. But once you learn how to do it, it's actually very effective. And, and what, yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say, and outside of the IoT realm, when you're just talking about um, the employees and the, the apps and, and uh, not about that automated things. Yeah, I think I think the, the reality is the, the depending on what operating system you have, the apps I think you can control, it's the operating system that you need to control on, and I think products like VMware and others need to be in this environment to help you do that. And, and we, we have good examples of where people have done it well unconsciously, and other examples where it's, it's actually out of control. Okay. So. Joe, I know uh, the, the Sprint is very active in IoT. Where, where, where do you see this going? Well, so, um, um, the Internet of Things uh, became the terminology, especially in this country. Our leader over at SoftBank would refer to it as the industrial internet, <laughs> suggesting that any industry that was created after the Industrial Revolution is going to go through a major change because of what we are talking about now. Uh, I think when you say automation or you say uh, uh, enhancing dispatch or contact center, one of the things in all of this that's really occurring the complexity is the workflow. That's the real hard part. But what you're actually trying to do is reduce the intervention so you don't need a dispatcher. Yeah. So there isn't a center for the contacts. And so uh, the complexity that customers in any industry uh, are, are faced with is the number of human beings that are looking at dated information or do not know why they're calling or, or they're not able to be um, intuitive. And so the winners 
are those P&L owners that choose to invest and deploy so that they digitize. And so, for example, at Sprint, um, we receive a lot of calls every month. We, we, we get awards for the customer care that we provide. So the real marriage is between IT and the P&L owner and the care organization, which usually transcends all those different owners within a corporation and enterprise. And so the idea is how do you reduce the transaction so that it's all automated? So on our phones, we have something called Sprint Zone. So we're on a mission to enable our users to deal with their bill, their device upgrade, uh, if they have an issue with coverage or anything else from the app that we're putting on the device. And interestingly, we're starting to see that kind of consumerization push back on the internal employees that are used to more of a concierge kind of service because we work here. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I, I think that that's what really you're going to see is a reduction in human intervention. That's really the name of the game. That's where all the savings are. And any group that you talk about that you count employees is probably going to go down over time. It's not a good thing to say in an election year, but it just seems like that's what's happening. All groups are going to get smaller with fewer people to do the same function, but to derive more productivity, uh, more, more revenue, but use fewer people. And I, I think that that's just kind of the way it is. I'm, I'm afraid too many of our audience have, uh, have heard that uh, do more with less line before. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, uh, now, uh, but Brian, you brought up an interesting uh, uh, issue that we always deal with in security, which is the, the, the balance. Um, that is, the more onerous and intrusive we make the security mechanisms. Uh, and I, I had to deal with like DOD uh, security where um, you, you had to change your password once a month. That had to be 10 digits, uh, mixed characters. You could never repeat it. Uh, and you weren't allowed to write it down. Uh, the, Obviously, we're not going to go that far. And things like Touch ID or, or you know, uh, Iris Biometric. Scans, uh, iVerify, all of those have taken a, a big step in the right direction. Uh, could you say a little bit about, one, are those playing into your single sign-on solution? And two, uh, take it a little further down the line, because the other big issue we wrestle with today, as you mentioned, we, we manage the data, we don't manage the device, uh, particularly the whole issue of data loss prevention. Sure. So. What's interesting is that biometrics, touch ID, and the like certainly make it easier. And, you know, what people don't realize is it's not just who you are that you can sign in. It's, you know, I have a device that I always carry with me. Mm -hmm. This is my phone. And therefore, I now have a second factor of authentication. I can put a certificate on this when you enroll. I can use that. But, you know, part of what we're starting to look at and something that VMware is very conscious of is what we like to call posture-based security. You don't need DOD security necessarily to look at your email. Now, if you're Coca-Cola and you're talking about the formula for Coke, which they keep in a vault and only three yeah. people or whatever see, maybe you need DOD security for that. And if someone's going to look at that on this device, we may require them to be in a certain location. We may actually require a DOD password or a third form of ID, maybe an iris scan or something else. But why raise the posture on the device if they're never doing that? and really look at the apps they're using and what they're trying to do and making it easy for them to get that done. You know, I think that also fits into IoT. So, you know, the big question is, how do you manage a million things like you manage one? And, you know, one of the advantages you have with managing phones and tablets and all is there are a lot more of them than PCs. So you gain a certain expertise. But, you know, I, you know, part of it is, even if we manage them and we secure them, and I thought, you know, you guys gave some great answers there, getting to your original question, Beth, it's how do we provide context to people so that they can have that, they can be where they need to be, you know, based upon Joe's answer, get done what they need to get done when they need to get it done. You know what's coming in. You know how it's working. Um, I talk about the Coca-Cola example. We help manage the Coca-Cola freestyle machines. Coca-Cola knows in their freestyle machines when they're going to break before they break. So the restaurateur or the movie theater that has them there doesn't know that they have a machine that's going to break in the next day or two. <coughs> Coca-Cola can dispatch someone, fix it before it's broken, and they don't see downtime. And those are the types of things that you're changing the way things work and how people actually deal with things. And I think that, you know, along with security, because first of all, Coca-Cola doesn't want that data going to Pepsi, obviously, and, you know, vice versa. And it becomes the same thing of 
you don't want other people to know how your car is doing or the like, and it's securing it, making it, enabling it, and giving the context when it's needed. Right. By, by the way, the other big secret in that safe is wh whether that's really Donald Trump's hair. <laughs> well, I'll leave you with that one. <laughs> Josh, well, well, one other side of the Mitel mobility story that we don't hear very much about is the, uh, the MVNO operation, uh, Mitel Mobile. Is that uh, somehow being brought in? Like, you, you seem to have a lot of different pieces between the, the, the Bonvenir acquisition, the, uh, uh, the, now the Field, uh, field Aware Association, uh, obviously the uh, traditional cloud-based and premise-based uh, uh, yep. PBX solution. Uh, Give us a little idea how this, uh, how this crossword puzzle fits together. Sure. Thank you, Michael. So one of the key things that we've seen, you know, as we've transitioned to LTE networks, Mitel's been an innovator uh, when we've led the charge with voice over LTE technology for the back-end mobile network operator environment. Uh, what we've done from an advanced messaging standpoint, as a matter of fact, AT&T's launched that now, uh, T-Mobile's launched that with us as well, uh, and we've uh, at this point got operators that have launched voice over Wi-Fi on three continents with Mitel's uh, architecture. So from an IMS perspective, Mitel's you know, a leader in that space, and what we did when we bought that asset was really took a look at the intersections of cloud, mobile and enterprise, and we're bringing our expertise to bear in the fact that we have the largest, uh, you know, fastest growing UC as a service cloud uh, in the industry today. Uh, we've got a very uh, embedded, uh, entrenched business, around 60 million end users using Mitel Enterprise Solutions, and now we've got mobile that we can really derive some very meaningful things around how we transition to new mobile cl cloud architectures. So the first thing that we've brought to market is uh, the embedded communications piece, which leverages a, a lot of the back end of our Mitel mobile architecture and combines that with our contact center expertise around sk skills-based routing, and then extends that out uh, through very easy to consume SDKs and APIs that can embed directly inside of other applications. So where your question was before, you know, is it something that you take packaged uh, off the shelf, mm -hmm. or is it something that you build as an IT department that's specific to your uh, industry, your company? Uh, both are an option when you take a look at Mitel's portfolio uh, across the board. And what we see is, as we continue to enable uh, what the mobile network operators are doing, uh, there will be additional components that they can take to enhance the way that their offerings uh, go to market as well. Uh, IoT for us is really uh, two key broad things. Uh, it's around um, connecting users to connected things. So for instance, identity management. I've got a mobile device, I jump in a corporate asset, uh, a vehicle, and I'm driving in that vehicle for the day. You've got telematics that are on board. You want to tie that back to the user. You want to make sure that my mobile usage is uh, limited while I'm in a driving state. Uh, you want to be able to track, you know, breadcrumb uh, location asset-based tracking uh, for the day, what my journeys were and, and where I stopped and how long it took me to complete certain tasks. So that's one piece of it. And the other piece was really, to Joe's point, uh, around the automation piece. It's about identifying, you know, like the Coke machines, for instance, a generator or refrigeration unit uh, that's going to be going out of service, getting that information into an automated workflow that can dispatch the right uh, individual at the right time. Um, so the, all those things are currently being enabled by Mitel's back in architecture around mobile. Okay. The, uh, now, our, our, our overall theme here is how we make uh, B2E more like B2C. Now, we'll, we'll, we'll start with, with Lee on this one because you're in the uh, solutions business. Uh, if a client were to come to AT&T and say, we, 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 we realize we're, we've fallen behind in terms of this mobility on our internal applications, what do we do to get on the right track? Well, how do you start, what, what general advice do you give them to start moving down the path? Well, I think there's two things that are hugely important in, in, in assuming it's the IT person that's coming is you've got to have a different partnership with your business. I mean, the, the, the rapid pace of the business that's going to bring those demands to you, you can't behave like you've behaved in traditional environments. You've got to be agile. And so you've got to have a partnership and a governance that's different than the governance that you've had historically. The second part is if you're going to be able to do that, uh, the demand and change and the pace of change is so much faster, you've got to have a, a way to deliver that. So the, the myriad of things that we've talked about here really come down to these, these two essential things, and it's being able to have an agile, quick way to deliver small, useful applications in a rapid format. And that requires tools and processes and things that, that do that. All, all of us have some form of those things which we provide, but you got to have that embedded in, in the corporation at a technical layer a, and a business user layer to make that work. Yeah. 
Joe, same question. And, and, and also, if you have any uh, 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 customers, you don't have to identify them by name, right. that uh, uh, you, you've seen go through this transition. Uh, and can describe a little about what they, uh, uh, what, what they did and the, uh, the benefits they saw to be great. Sure. So just to use a, a real easy example, um, would be somebody that's in the ice making business and they put bags of ice in a cooler outside of, you know, every place you've ever been, right? <laughs> so if that machine stops working, it's probably really bad, right, for the business. Well, they can be in the water business. <laughs> they'll just have some water, <laughs> that's right. So, so uh, that's a fairly easy thing to identify that you could put a device in there that's going to determine what the temperature is. It's going to know how many times the doors open and close, maybe a weight sensor. Uh, if you have two different size bags of ice, then you can tell as the bags are taken out because of the weight um, what people have a predilection to buy based on, you know, whether it's a holiday weekend or not. And then, uh, so then you can tie that in with the dispatcher uh, who in turn is routing the ice trucks. Uh, maybe they also do some kind of um, uh, preventative maintenance or or able to escalate differently. So, so probably the most important thing um, is when you start small like that, it's easier to prove in because you, you have to save money, right? I mean, th th this idea of we're going to mobilize the application, I mean, you still got to come up with a cost. So th th to me, the difference with, with the, the consumer model and the enterprise model, um, you know, so in um, highly transactional businesses that kind of that they do it the same way like in a restaurant so so open table or yelp with with how they get their feedback and and that that connective tissue in the in the social medias that touch it mm -hmm. so all of a sudden you have an entire industry that has changed in a relatively short period of time so you've seen this with the asset tracking and, and the uh, the vehicle tracking uh, with large workforces that are that are in moving vehicles, that seems to have been something that has checked the box, and you're, you're seeing that proliferate very quickly. So, to me, what it means is is that enterprises will probably start adopting more common ways of doing things, as opposed to trying to be differentiated in their workflow. They'll probably need to save money first in order to differentiate later, because you, you you've got to reduce your costs in order to survive. Uh, Brian, at, at what point in that adventure should they start thinking about security and the management? Is, uh, uh, can they simply go through the app development, uh, then at the, the 11th hour give you guys a jingle and away you go? I would say at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I think that if security isn't part of, part of the process in the beginning, and you know, from my time in the enterprise, you know, the biggest thing you'd see is the line of business would go develop an app, get ready to release, and security would say no. Now, we have some tools, and there are other people with tools that make it easier for them to say yes, which is awesome. But you got to start looking at securing in the beginning, and you know, how do you develop in a secure framework? What are the capabilities that are there? How do you reuse existing things that are already secure? You know, how do you feed into single sign-on? How do you feed into a secure container? How do, you know, we have the app config partnership that we announced with a bunch of other EMM vendors, or you know, there are also SDKs and the like out there, which you know, we all play with, mm -hmm. that you can use for security and build frameworks that allow you to build those apps and push them out and actually you know, be part of that and get that done. Could you say a little more about the, uh, the app config uh, uh, group? Because that was just announced at the Mobile World Congress a couple of weeks ago, and it sounded like it was, it was going to address one of the big problems we've been facing with this from day one. Sure. App Config is um, a great group. It's actually, right now, there are four founding members with um, VMware, MobileIron, Jamf, and IBM. Mm -hmm. We expect some other EMMs to join. Yeah. And, you know, what we've done is we've said we're working, we have 60 members already who have, you know, pledged their apps and, you know, whether they're SaaS or whether they have their own apps, Oracle, Salesforce, and the like. But the point is, develop a schema that makes it easy for people to develop these apps, make sure they're secured, make sure they're easy to enable for single sign-on, regardless of who uses it. One of the reasons we banded together is we need to make it easy for everybody. You shouldn't have to figure out which app you're getting, you know, which is the one for your EMM vendor or anything else. Mm -hmm. Apple signed on, so this is actually on Apple's page. 
I would expect to hear something from the other side soon. Yeah. So, you know, it, this is really trying to be a standard and, you know, be out there and open to everybody. Hey. Beth? Well, we do have a couple of questions from the audience. So, we, with that two minutes left, we might as well go ahead and take one. And, and I think that, um, Brian, you were addressing this in, in that last question, but um, we do have a question about um, the, best, the best path forward with native app development for uh, mobility. Is that with WebRTC? Is that with HTML5? Where do you see that? Uh, Any of you? I've, I'll, I'll oh. start off and hand it real quick. I think that you need to do all of them. And I think it's a question of people get caught in a standard before trying to figure out what they're trying to build. Mm -hmm. Figure out what you're trying to build first, then figure out the standards that make sense and are you building it for a laptop, tablet, you know, phone, or all the like, and then figure out what works best for that versus saying, I'm only going to build HTML5 and, then, and that may not work well across everything. Joe? So I'm going second because I didn't get the sock method. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll write you next yeah, year. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, um, so, so one of our partners, uh, Dialpad, formerly known as Switch, um, you know, it was all about uh, Google, and then uh, they wanted to reinvent so that they could uh, work very well with Google or Microsoft. So WebRTC was the, the path that they took, and uh, so that, that's a real example that's taken place in the last few months. It depends on the platform. Mm -hmm. uh, it really does. Uh, when you think about the usability of a field workforce that's on tablets and mobiles, uh, WebRTC is most likely not the right tool uh, from a front-end exposure through a browser, but what we've done is we've been able to take WebRTC uh, th as an engine that connects the browser to SDKs that you embed inside of apps, and now it becomes usable on both fronts. Um, so you really have to think about the application of, of the device and how it's being implemented. Yeah. Lee, do you have any last thoughts? Yeah, my, my quick one is, it depends on the user, because each user has different things, and our, our experience is, you have to have uh, both a hybrid and native environment to deliver to a comprehensive enterprise. Okay. And do that. Well, and on that note, thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate your insight, and thank you all for attending. Pleasure. Pleasure. Good job. Good job. Good job. Yeah.